Okay, so now we're getting into the exciting stuff. Everybody loves gold cards in Commander, and I am no exception. Uh, definitely a lot of uh, stuff to go over here, so this will probably be one of the, one of the longer segments. Um, so, um, Belladross Witherbloom is a 7-mana dragon, 4-4 um, four, four flyer. So, 7-mana 4-4 four, four flyer, what's going on here? At the beginning of your upkeep, create... Of each upkeep, sorry. So, this is a Force of Nature style effect. Excuse me. Force of Nature style effect. Force of nature style effect. Um, each upkeep, you get a 1 1 pest. And of course, all pests uh, sack uh, to gain, or not sack, but when they die, you gain a life. Um, but then it has this very interesting ability that says pay 10 life. So, like, no joke, 10 life is a lot, even in Commander. That is a quarter of your entire life. Um, untap all lands you control, but you can only do it once per turn. So, basically, for the cost of 10 life, you get to pretty much have like a, a pseudo time walk effect um, in black green, which is notable, right? Cause like for blue, that's nothing special, but in black green, that's that's a big game. And it's a cool card. It's a cool card. It does a, like, these two effects are very, very different. And I'm not entirely sure how they're intended to synergize with each other, right? Like one is just, you know, wants you to like go wide and make a bunch of tokens and do token synergies. And then the other one kind of has like a lands matter sub theme of like, you know, because like this isn't black. So let's remember the Cabal Coffers is a card that you get to play in this. Paying 10 life to untap your Cabal Coffers to tap it for like another 10 mana or whatever is a very, very real thing. Like that's going to kill people, right? Like you, you tap, you know, 18 mana because you have a Cabal Coffers. Like you've got like, you know, 10 lands in your Cabal Coffers or Borg or whatever. And so you're making like what, 17 mana, I think is the math on that. If two of your 10 lands... Are uh, our coffers and Urborg. And then you untap for 10 life, and then you make another 17. Um like th that's that's a butt ton of mana, right? You're gonna that, that's an, that's you're dead to expro uh, not expropriate exsanguinate, you're dead to uh you're dead to, to torment of hailfire, you know, all your classic like black X sort of quote unquote burn spells, fireball spells. It's a powerful ability. Um the weirdest thing is how disjointed they are, as I said. It sort of means that you can kind of build this in a few different ways, which I think is interesting flexibility-wise. The biggest hang-up on this is it is a seven-mana card, so you're not going to get to do this very often, and I don't think people are going to like want to let you untap with it. The nice thing is if it resolves, you do get to activate its ability right away. It's not a tap ability or anything like that. So if the card does resolve, even if it dies right afterwards, you are still going to get that untap all ends you control ability if you're able to pay the cost. So I think... This is a really, really powerful card. I don't know exactly what people are going to do with it yet, but I'm excited to find out because I think it is one of the more sort of high upside, high power things uh, from the new set that could be happening here. Um, Blade Historian is... It's kind of a boring card, but it's a very powerful card. Like, don't underestimate attacking creatures have Double Strike. Double Strike is a really, really, really busted ability, even in Commander. Because, like, there are so many things that do things when they hit you. And so doubling up on those things, right? Drawing an extra card off of each hit. Um, you know, all the swords of X and Y effects would trigger twice. Um, or, like, there, there's a ton of other things I'm not even thinking about right now. Things like Hunter's Will, things like that. Right? Where you can get, like, extra mana between your phases. Like, lo lots and lots and lots of effects that are on hit effects that are really powerful. And also just doing a lot of damage, which, you know... Boros does want to do. Usually it's winning via combat, right? That is what Boros does in Commander most of the time. I think this effect is strong. It's not going to be it for every deck, and it is, again, pretty linear and not exciting, but it is powerful. Um, and sometimes you just need to do the good, like, the powerful thing, not always the splashy thing. Uh, so keep an eye on this. I do think that this card is pretty good. Uh, Blood Out of the Sky, I think, is a really, really cool card. Um... It's a really interesting card because it actually didn't do what I thought it did the first time I read through it. So the, the initial uh, um, words are failing me. The initial comparison that I was making was the Marshall Coup, which is like a really old school card from like, I want to say Conflux or something. Um, which basically says, uh, you know, uh, it's like white, white X make X-1-1 one, one soldiers, and if X was five or more, destroy all creatures um, before making those soldiers, um, then make X soldiers. So the idea is like you wipe the board and then you get left with some present, like, you know, board presence in the form of 1-1 one, one soldiers. 
This is quite similar in that, right, it's basically black, white, X, make X, two white, uh, two one flyers. They are tapped, mind you, but whatever. That, like, unless you have haste, that's not a huge deal. Although they're not great blockers, to be fair. That being said, though, this destroys non-creature non-land permanence. So this is actually going to blow up everything except creatures, rather than everything that is creatures. So what this is going to do is it's going to blow up mana rocks and enchantments and planeswalkers maybe as well. So it's not as ubiquitous as I thought it would be. It is not a wrath. But making a, a reasonably large number of 2 and flyers while blowing up everybody's utility permanence, enchantments especially, because there's some really strong enchantments nowadays, is still a really cool card. So this isn't like, I think that like this is the kind of card that I would be very seriously considering playing if I was... You, I think you need to care about the tokens. I don't think you play this card if you don't care about the tokens, because you could just play like, you know, um, what is it? Uh, crush, uh, um, oh, like Return to Dust or, or Crush Contraband or things like that to get rid of, you know, two artifacts or enchantments, which this is going to do a lot of the time anyway. Um, but if you care about the tokens, then having the additional rider of blowing up all the non-creature, non-land permanents is like pretty cool. Um... Yeah, Cleansing Nova is probably an okay comparison. But again, Nova does hit um, creatures. This does not. And not hitting creatures, I do think, is going to be what makes it more of a uh, 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 a niche card. Because it's not just a board reset. Um, but cool card. Really cool card. Also, great, hilarious name. Blot out the sky. Um, all right. Well, we got to talk about Body of Research because that's a card. Um, so, uh, for anyone who is unfamiliar, this is essentially a black border version of the card Animate Library, uh, which is from a, uh, from a, from an unset from a couple of years ago, uh, where basically you, uh, you attached an aura to your library, which of course makes no real mechanical sense, but unsets didn't have to. And then the library was just an XX creature where X was the number of cards in your library. Um... This is functionally the same thing. For what for an extra mana, it's just a sorcery. And rather than animating your literal library, because again, that's weird, it just gives you an XX or X is just the number of cards in your library. So basically, again, we're playing Commander. This is frequently going to be, like if you're playing this on turn six, this is frequently going to be like an 80 power creature. Now it is just a vanilla 80-80, just. Um, like, you know, we've all seen like Lords of Extinction be like probably in that range. Um, as well and lord of extinction does get jump blocked by one ones god if it was an instant that would be sick if it was instant but yeah so you know this isn't just like some big game ending bomb it has zero abilities it's just literally like a big dumb doofus but if somebody doesn't have blockers or you have the ability to give it unblockable or flying or whatever then like you know gotta help your opponents they're gonna die to this real bad um because odds are it's gonna be far larger than their life total at most points in the game um, so really, really, a really, really interesting and amusing card. It's expensive. Six mana is not nothing, but you do get a lot for six mana. And by a lot, I just mean one enormous Chungus. You will see this card get played. It is just like way too fun and unique not to see play. I'm not going to claim that it's going to be, a, it's a particularly good card. Again, end of the day, making just one big dumb idiot is not that impressive, but it is a very fun card and a very interesting card. Um, moving on here. Um, ooh, color ritual is a really interesting one to me. Um, so this is like a weird kind of almost wrath where basically it's just gonna like so this basically says destroy each non land permanent. Now that's a very interesting set of four words with mana value two or less. So this is not gonna be a board wipe in most situations, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna get rid of like everybody's mana rocks, everybody's libraries everybody's mana dorks all of those things are going to be gone so if you're playing this early enough in the game if you're playing this like on four you're going to ruin a lot of people's early game acceleration plans especially if they're not playing green um which is a little bit unfortunate because you know green could probably stand to get punished a little bit more because it doesn't punish like rampant growth effects it doesn't blow up lands um but again if anybody's ramping using mana dorks or mana rocks those are all gone and for a reasonably reason uh like affordable cost of four mana um and not only that, but you actually get a black or green mana for every permanent that blew up this way. So it's not difficult for this to just essentially pay for itself. And it's still not that difficult for it to actually generate mana for you. So you can have like a weird like blow up everybody's mana rocks, ramp into my six drop on turn four type 
of of turn, which is pretty cool. Um, so again, not a, like a card that's going to just see play in every black green deck ever or anything, but a really really interesting and um, and unique effect uh, for uh, for that color pair for any color pair really. Like I don't think any card exists really like this uh, that I've seen. Really cool card. Really cool card. Um. The Demigoth, uh, Titan, the, uh, the Goth Girlfriend, as, uh, as I've seen some people refer to it as. It's big. It costs four mana. It doesn't really do anything else. If you actually want to be sacking creatures, it's, like, a pretty good out sack outlet. The biggest problem is, again, it's not a on-command sack outlet, which is usually what you want them to be. Like, you can play, like, this is, like, I don't know. It's it's clunky. It's, again, it's large enough, cheap enough, and has, a like, a reasonable enough effect that I don't think I can completely discount the card. But it's clunky and probably not going to do what you want it to do more often than not, in my opinion. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sold here. I'm not sold here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Uh, ooh, Dina, Dina, Dina. Not really sure yet. I'm going to say Dina. Uh, Soul Steeper uh, is a really cool card. Uh, this is just like another um, sort of Sanguine Bond combo piece, right? Anytime you gain life, they lose life. And if they lose life, you gain life, etc., etc. And you just loop it forever. So this goes infinite with a couple of different things. Um, as well as just being a very reasonable sort of like, just like kind of nickel and dime your opponent's to death effect. Right? Just in a black green life game deck, this is just gonna deal a reasonable amount of damage to your opponents in the in the in the in the grand scheme of things. Um it also has a cool sec outlet, which is not bad either. Um so again, could be useful. Again, like I, I could see this being really good in like sort of blood artist type effects or blood artist uh decks where like you sack a creature, triggers the blood artist, blood artist deals a damage to your opponent, and you gain life, then you gain life and it triggers Dina. Um that's probably the coolest use case for this. Uh, solid little body, solid little card. Probably just probably better than 99 than as the commander, but definitely fine in both situations, I think. Um, I have a friend who actually is building this as a commander, and I am curious to see how that deck uh, plays out. Um, haven't had the chance to see it yet, but I am uh, interested to see what it'll do. Um, Double Major is a very interesting spell indeed. I'm a little worried about the fact that it only i mean worried in the sense that i don't think like tacking two mana onto a creature spell that you're casting is not nothing right like yes this can literally give you an extra copy of your commander but that also means that you're essentially willingly paying an additional commander tax to cast it which is going to be like rough on any commander that costs like five or more right because if you're casting your commander for the first time and you want to double major it, you actually have to wait till turn seven and if you have a five drop commander, right? If, you're, if, you've, if you've already cast it once, you gotta wait till turn nine to do this. And so it's clunky, right? It's a very, very powerful effect that pays off, right? Like I'm imagining like, you know, double majoring your Yarok and now you have double two Yaroks and you're getting like triple triggers off of all your ATBs, right? Or, um, you know, you're, you're double majoring something like, Lord, I don't know. Um, God, what are other dumb, like, I don't know. You're double majoring, like, your Tatiova, right? And you're now you're getting two cards and two life off of every land you play or something, right? These are all, like, really strong things that you can be doing. But they're costing you a lot of tempo and a lot of mana to do that. So, and that's, like, God forbid, like, your opponent has a counter spell or something and you just get completely blown out. Because the thing is, you're going to want to hold priority with this, right? So if you go cast my, like, I'm on seven mana, I'm trying to cast my Tatiova, and then I want to copy it. I have to hold priority and cast double major in order to copy it. Um, because if I wait to see if my opponent counters it, I'm not going to get priority again before it resolves. And again, notably, this only counters creature spell, so it needs to be... Uh, yeah, it... You're... Yeah, again, uh, Pete's, uh, Pete's already living in my head here. Um, I'll get to that comment in a second. Basically, again, the, the timing restrictions for this card, I think, are where are going to hurt it. It's a very powerful effect if you get to do it, but it's just so clunky. The, because, again, the fact that it says creature spell, it's a little confusingly worded, but it means that the spell needs to be on the stack. Once a creature is resolved, it is no longer considered a spell. It is a permanent. So this isn't just, like, two mana clone your commander and it doesn't get legend ruled. It has to be on the stack. 
and that's gonna hurt, that's gonna hurt it real bad. The other thing is that it has to be something you control. So you can't copy your opponent's creature for two mana. Um, like there's a couple of knobs and dials that they turned down on this, I think, probably for a good reason. I'm not, maybe it wasn't like this originally, but the knobs have been turned in such a way that it's gonna require like you to like jump through quite a few hoops to get your value out of this. If you ever do, you're gonna be off to the races, but but it's it's asking a lot. It's asking a lot for an admittedly very powerful effect though. Um, Pete in the chat mentions that it seems worse than Spark Double, and I absolutely agree. For four mana, Spark Double copying an on the board permanent is is much, 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 much better because Spark Double also can have, like, you know, isn't as easily countered, right? If you have multiple permanents, even if they kill your best permanent, you can still Spark Double your next best permanent. It just, it's a lot safer and a lot more, um, and you get to use it in a lot more scenarios without getting blanked. Uh, so I do think that if you're looking for an ability to clone your legendary creature, um, there's two copies of Sak two different versions of Sakashima that exist right now and Spark Double, and I think those are all better than Double Major, personally. Um, moving, uh, moving on. Um, Dramatic Finale is the other card out of uh, Silver Quill that makes me just, or out of this set that makes me just immeasurably sad that I don't get to play it in my Kaikar deck, uh, which is, again, a token tribal deck, um, because, of course, it does have the uh, the black mana cost here. So creature goat tokens get plus one, plus one, and then whenever one or more non-token creatures die, you get a 2-1 Flying Inkling. Now, that being said, like, the card is pretty dialed down, right? A non-creature has to, token creature has to die to get this effect, which is fair because, again... You know, otherwise it would just go infinite. Basically, like, you kill a token, you get a new token. So they can just never kill your tokens, basically. You'll just always get a replacement token. Um, and that would be too good, I think. Now, that being said, it only triggers once per turn. So over time, they would get there. Again, this effect is pretty dialed down, but it's a really cool effect. If you're in a black-white X or just black-white tokens deck, this is a really cool card for that deck, I think. Um, something like a Tesa or Zav Scion kind of uh, situation could definitely uh, could definitely benefit from this. So yeah, keep an eye out on that. Um, moving on. Ooh, yes, moving on. All right, we get, you know, yeah, Gov. I could see Gov wanting that. Um, although again, sacrificing your Sapperlings in Gov doesn't trigger that because it does say non-token creature. That being said, it does make all your Sapperlings two two. So you know, there's synergies here and there. Um, Eureka moment is really good. Uh. You know, we've all seen Growth Spiral. How about two Growth Spirals stapled to each other? Not quite, because you still only get to put a single land onto the battlefield, so it's not literally two Growth Spirals stapled together. It's not draw two cards, and then you may put up to two lands into play. But still, four mana instant speed draw two and then play a land is a really strong card. Um, there are a lot of sort of Saltai and Teamer and just base uh, Simic decks that are going to be very, very, very happy to have this. Um, you know, you basically hold up your counter magic and your and some other stuff, and then if you didn't need to use it, you know, end step cast Eureka moment, draw a couple more cards, ramp yourself a little bit. It's just a good, good, good bread and butter simic uh ramp slash draw spell. It's not a strictly speaking ramp spell because you may whiff on lands, you're not guaranteed to make a land drop off of it. But drawing two cards is definitely better than drawing one card. You have, you know, twice as many chances to hit that land, right? Um, I'm thinking about this in decks like um, decks like Tassiger, decks like um, Damia, Sages of Stone, uh, decks like um, what Calamax, that new, uh, the new uh, legend from, well, I guess it's still new. It's within a year of now, so that's new enough. Uh, but yeah, Calamax, the uh, the teamer uh, instant doubler uh, from uh, from the Ikoria precon uh, commanders, like getting to cast double Eureka moment um, for four mana sounds really, really cool to me. Um, so yeah, you'll see a Eureka moment out of the Simic decks for sure, I think. Um, yeah, sweet card. Very sweet card. Uh, ooh, speaking of sweet cards, Expressive Iteration is really cool. I think this may be one of my favorite cards out of the entire set. Um, and I think that's not, I think that's the case for a lot of people for a lot of formats just because of how efficient this card is. It just does a lot for not a lot. So, People may be familiar with the card Telling Time. That one said, look at the top three cards of your library, put one in your hand, one on the bottom of your library, and then one back on top of your library. This is so much better. This looks at the top three cards, but instead of putting one back on top of your library, it actually just exiles one instead, which sounds bad, except that you get to play the exiled card. And again, 
added gravy, the keyword here is that you get to play the exiled card, which means you do get to play lands off of this. So again, you look at the top three cards and you have, you know, let's say you have a card, like a card you really want to draw right now. Uh, and then there's a land and then there's a card that you kind of don't really need right now, right? You get the card you want, you exile the land, play the land because you, oh yeah, uh, pro tip, do not play your, do not, not donut, do not play your land um, before uh, before casting the spell because you will get to play a land off of the exile clause and that's just kind of free value. This is essentially a two mana draw to with upside in, my, in most scenarios. Um, maybe not with upside, but like, it's like a sideways two mana draw to because one of the cards you do have to play that turn, you're committed to playing it. The other one you do get to keep in hand though for however long you want. Um, alternatively, like I said, if you're later in the game, you just don't really need to make a land drop, right? You see a land, um, a spell, and then two spells. You get to like put one of the spells in your hand, play another one of the spells off the exile and put the land on the bottom because you don't care about it. If you hit a situation where you're drawing like a spell in two lands, you get to bottom a land, exile a land, play it, then you still get to draw that spell. So it's replaced itself and gotten you an extra land drop. It just does a lot. I'm really, yeah, I don't know. Pete's not a big fan. I I really like these sort of very sort of cheap cantrippy utility cards. I think that they were like they're, they're like they're the crucial cog pieces for a lot of the for a lot of decks in Commander. It is never going to be the best card in your deck. It's not going to be very flashy. It's just, it's just going to be, it's just always going to be good. Like, it's good in the same way that, like, Chart of Course is good and Preordain is good, right? If you like those cards, this card is really a lot of that. That it's doing a lot of those same things, but with a different twist on it. Um, this isn't better than Chart of Course, but it's also not worse. I think this is very sideways to Chart of Course. Like... Don't look at this as like some big splashy card. Just look at it as a really good way to kind of just generate card advantage and card selection for yourself at a very, very low cost. And again, if you're playing a deck where casting an instant or sorcery matters, then like now it's just gravy. Again, I'm thinking about Kaikar, right? I do this, get two cards out of it, and I get to make a spirit token. Like that's messed up. Um, you know, you're playing this in your, um, oh, I don't know. I'm sort of like drawing a blank. Talran doesn't actually work because it is red. But in a deck that has Talran, like your blue, like blue, red, something, I don't know. It's got a lot of applications. It's a very cheap, flexible, um, solid little card. And I think that it is honestly probably going to be one of the better cards to come out of this set, um, generally speaking. It's not flashy, it's just good. Um, Fracture is a really interesting one because it really does sort of put the limit on like how flexible can a card be while not doing the main thing you want it to do in order to have you include it, right? So this is an instant that matters. So this is Fracture, a white and a black for an instant that destroys target artifact, enchantment, or planeswalker. Now you'll notice that it does not say target creature, which would make it auto include in everything forever. It would actually just be a really messed up card if this was a, if this could also hit creatures. This would be like Mortify with upside for one less. Um, like it would almost be a better Vindicate at that point. Uh, Although it wouldn't still hit lands and vindicate, but like vindicates a sorcery for three. Um, bottom line is this hits a lot of stuff, like a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, it just doesn't hit creatures, and creatures are often what you want to be removing. But it removes literally any other permanent that is not a creature for two mana at instant speed. Uh, notably, this can be part of a Sunforger package. It's an instant, so you can find this with a Sunforger um, if you're in a Mardu deck. That is obviously Sunforger obviously requires you to be base Boros, but if you're Mardu. Or, um, or beyond, then this is a Sunforger target, which I think is really cool. I don't think every black-white deck ever is going to want to play this, but I do think that this is a card that people should seriously consider over some of their other um, non-creature targeted removal spells because it is very flexible, right? Like, you wouldn't play Disenchant, which this is essentially very close to, but Disenchant does let you kill doesn't let you kill Planeswalkers, and this does. And that that makes a difference, because there are some Planeswalkers in Commander that really need to get answered right away. So this is like, again, not an auto-include in Black-White by any stretch of the imagination, but definitely a card I would keep my eye on. Um, definitely the kind of card that can make an impact just from being a relatively strong and flexible answer to a wide variety of problematic permanents. Um, all right, Galazeth Prismari, our... Uh, or second uh, Elder Dragon, I believe, uh, from the set. Um, 
This card's cool. This card's really cool. Most of the Elder Dragons are, honestly. I think they did a really cool job with them of making them, like, not too broken while still having quite powerful effects. So, at base, it's a 4-mana 3-4 flyer uh, that makes a treasure when it enters. So, it essentially sort of, again, rebates itself by 1. Costs essentially 3 if you need the treasure right away to pay for something else in the same turn. Um... But it also has a really cool ability of Artifice Control. I've tapped to add one mana of any color. However, you can only uh, use this as, uh, to cast instants or sorceries. So it's a little bit interesting because this kind of like wants you to do a couple of different things, right? It wants you to both have enough artifacts that you can benefit from this ability. And in theory, it wants them to be artifacts that wouldn't already be tapping for mana, right? Like if you're like mana rocks, like, you know... It makes your signets tap for any color rather than having to like filter through them or whatever, which can be good because signets don't actually tap for anything by themselves um, if you don't have another mana somewhere to float through them. So like it upgrades your signets a little bit, but like generally speaking, it's not that valuable. Um, but it also wants you to have enough instants and sorceries that the artifacts tapping have something to cast. Because again, it's not to do anything. Like the, the artifacts you control tap for any color, but only to cast instants and sorceries. So... It's relatively conditional. Like, this is no Urza, don't get me wrong. Like, Urza is just miles better than this because Urza is a, you know, more splashable or more flexible. You can play it in any blue deck, not just a, not a red blue, like it doesn't have to be a red blue deck. And Urza also has a uh, built-in mana sink for the mana that it makes. Um, Urza also makes a creature rather than a treasure, which is probably better. Uh, and then most importantly, Urza also uh, lets you tap the mana to do anything, which is better than for aliens and sorceries. So this is not Urza, but that's okay because Urza was a really broken magic card and probably not actually that good for the format of EDH as a whole, in my opinion. Um, whereas Galazeth Basmari is going to be fair, balanced, but strong. Um, and I am excited to see what people decide to start doing with this card. Um... Golden Ratio has to be one of my favorite arts in the entire set. It's just, like, very cool. Um, just, like, all these, like, sort of animals, like, kind of messing around and creating a literal Golden Ratio out of the out of the art. Great, great, great flavor. Great card, great art. The card itself, I'm a little bit suspect about. It obviously, like, the Christmas line is you draw, like, five cards for three mana off of this. The fail case is you draw, like... Well, the fail case is you draw no cards, right? This requires you to have at least a creature in order to draw anything. Um... And the fact that it needs to be different power for everybody is also tricky because, like, it means, like, you know, you've got to have a 1-1 one, one and a 2-2 two, two and a 3-3 three, three and a 4-4, four, four, right? So, like, if you have three creatures but they're all 3-3s, three, you still only draw one card, which is, like, kind of meh. Um, but, again, without, without having thought about it super, super heavily, I do believe that there are going to be decks in EDH that are quite happy with this card. Um... And you'll you, like I would encourage you to take a look in your Simic decks. And if you're playing like a, a creature-based Simic deck, take a look at your creatures, take a look at their powers at any given point during your board states, and be like, how many cards would I draw off Golden Ratio right now if I had it in my hand? And if the answer is like three or more, you're probably interested in putting a golden ratio in your hand or in your deck. I don't think you want to play this if you're not drawing minimum three off of it. Like, otherwise it's just a bad divination, and that's not gonna cut it. But if you can consistently draw three plus cards off of this in your Simic creature deck, this is a good card. So not for every deck, not even for every Simic deck, um, but will be good when it's good. Because uh, again, drawing three plus cards for three mana is a hell of a bargain. Um, then we have uh, Harness Infinity, which is a really cool card. Um, illustrated by one of my personal favorites, and to be fair at this point, probably most many people's personal favorites, Seb McKinnon um shout out to a uh, fellow uh canadian um but a really cool effect um this is probably most comparable to the card um praetor's council which is what five green 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 i think it costs and it essentially just lets you buy back your entire graveyard to your hand and you have no max hand size for the rest of the game um i think this is worse than that honestly because notably it does not allow you to eliminate your hand size cap at any point. So, you know, if you have a graveyard of 20 cards, great. That's cool and everything. But, and it is instant, which means you can do this at the end of your opponent's turn and then untap with a hand of 20 cards or whatever. But you're going to need to burn through most of those 20 cards on your next turn, or you're just going to have to re-discard a whole bunch of them anyway. So it doesn't give you as much time to work with the resources that it's generating. And I think that's a pretty big knock against it. 
Um, like, I honestly do think that I would rather play Praetor's Grass for an extra mana, even at sorcery speed, because of the fact that it's going to allow me to um, to just keep those cards beyond the turn that I cast the card. Oh, yeah, don't get me wrong. I also think that this card could just win it. It's, like, this card will probably let people win if they're just buying back a combo from the graveyard. Um, it depends, basically. Yeah, if you're using this to win, if you're using this to combo, this card is better because being instant is fantastic. If you're using it for value, I think Parader's Council is better. And I guess, again, this is my own personal bias. I don't really play combo decks. Like, I have some combo interactions in certain decks, maybe. But 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 I'm not, like, thinking combo-minded when I play Commander, personally. And that, that's a playstyle preference. That's a personal thing. Um, but yes, I do believe that Harness Infinity is the better combo en enabler. Um, I think that Praetor's Council is the better value uh, generator. So, depends on what your priorities are with that kind of card. Um, but but it's a it's a fair point and uh, and well pointed out that this being instant and giving you that card selection can sometimes be all you need if you're just planning on winning the next turn. That's very true. Um, so, um, so yeah, really cool card. Pretty like not I was um, like relatively unique effect given that it's an instant speed version of this effect. Again, you'll know if your deck wants this. Um, not every deck will, but the decks that want it will be very happy it exists. Um, ooh, Horfrey Ghost Forge. This card is cool. This card is really, really cool. This is definitely like the kind of design I like to see R&D going with on um, on Boros slash red slash white cards, especially for legendaries, because it's doing stuff that doesn't currently exist in, the, in that color combination. So... First and foremost, it's a 5 mana 4-5 that's a Spirit Lord. It is not itself a Spirit, um, but it does give all Spirits plus 1, plus 1, Trample, and Haste. And, like, that's a serious set of stats. Um, the really strong stuff, and it synergizes with the first text line quite nicely, is that whenever another non-token creature you control dies, exile it. If you do create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a Spirit in addition to its other types... Um, and it has, when this creature leaves the battlefield, you return the exiled card to your graveyard. So, basically what this is going to do is, like, say you got an ET... Like, you want to play this in an ETB deck, right? This is essentially, like, perfect for a red-white ETB deck. Um, and if it's got some spirits that have cool ETBs, all the better. Um, but yeah, what essentially this does is, when the card dot When any card you, di you have dies, you get to exile it for a bit. You make a token copy of it, so you're going to re-trigger that ETB by making the token copy... And then that copy now has plus one, plus one, trample, and haste. You get to send that in right away at people. Get some more value out of it. And then if that card, or when that card dies, um, or not even dies, leaves the battlefield. So if they exile it, whatever, it doesn't matter. You don't actually lose the card that you exiled forever. You actually just get it back to your graveyard. So you can recur it in other ways later on. So you're not actually, like, giving up the, re the, the real card forever. So, like, you don't even get, like, like it, you just kind of get to do it all with this card. And I think it's really cool. Um... Like, I'm thinking of, like, you know, Sun Titan with this. I'm thinking Skyclave Apparition with this. I'm thinking, um, I don't even know, Flicker Wisp. Like, all these, like, cool ETB creatures in this color combination. Inferno Titan as well in red. Um, Zealous Conscripts. Like, the, the, the combinations are kind of endless. Um, I actually thinking about this. This card actually kind of sounds like a busted, like, sort of Kiki Jiki shell. Um, yeah, Gearhulks for sure. Although I don't love either of the Gearhulks in this color combination, but Gearhulks do work. I'm actually thinking like this might actually just be like a really like solid Kiki Jiki commander. Um, because you can put Kiki Jiki, Zealous Conscripts, Resto Angel, and uh Felidar Guardian, even Village Bell Ringers, if that's if you're really gonna trying to go deep on that. And it makes the combo really difficult to disrupt because if they destroy the creature to try to stop the pot uh, the combo, you just get to exile it, make a copy. And then keep comboing, which is like really, really, really good redundancy there. So I actually just came, I just thought of that right now at the top of my head. And like, I'm kind of down with that. Like, not everybody's going to be pleased with you for just bringing the Kiki Jiki combo deck to the EDH table. So, you know, <laughs> gauge your play group and figure out if that's a thing that your play group's going to be cool with or not. But, but that is a thing. And like, this card gives you a lot of redundancy for those effects. Um, while being good with all the individual cards as well, because of the fact that they're all ETB based. Um, I think this card is super, super cool. Um, okay, let's move on. Um, honestly, I don't like this Casmina at all, quite frankly. Like, 
giving your other walkers these abilities is not that good because these abilities are not that good. Um, so I'm not really going to talk about Kazmina. I honestly think she's super boring. Like, yes, she's a three mana Simic card. And like, those are often eyebrow raising. I don't think this card is very interesting. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I just, I don't, I'm not buying this. Uh, Killian is uh, another one of the uncommon legendary creatures from the set. You can uptick Narset now. Okay, yeah. She's obviously very good with the Warwalkers because you get to get extra abilities out of cards that previously could only downtick. I don't think that's good enough to make me think this is good. Because if you're putting Narset in your deck, like, you don't need the Kazmina. You're just, like, probably wheeling people and making everyone sad and angry. So just do that. It's fine. Like, all you need is to have Narset in one wheel and you're fine anyway. Like, if you're up to, like, it's just, it's not necessary. <laughs> it's cool. It's a fun little interaction, but it's not necessary. That might be a cool, like, that might be a cool historic interaction or something. But again, this is not the historic set review. This is the commander set review. Um, and I do not believe the Kazmina is particularly exciting for that format. Or for, yeah, for commander. Um, but, you know, send me your screenshots if you get to do cool things with her. Um, all right, Killian Ink Duelist, Lifelink Menace 2-2. Uh, the big right, the big sort of uh, thing here is the spells you cast to target a creature cost two less to cast. So basically this is all your removal spells and all your pump spells and all your whatever else spells are cheaper. None of that sounds very exciting in a, command, a format like Commander. Um, this might be cool for Brawl um, on Arena, but again, not really talking about that right now. But because then it's like a 1v1 format and this ability is much more powerful when you're talking 1v1. But in a multiplayer format, this is kind of just like meh. It might be a card you put in the 99 of a different deck um, that I'm not thinking about right now, but um, not incredible or anything. Um, ooh, Lorehold Command I think is quite cool. It's very expensive. It is, I believe, the most expensive of the commands, but it does give you a fair number of like pretty interesting abilities. Um, the Create a 3-2 Red Spirit token is fine. It's not very exciting. It's definitely not the most exciting part of this by any stretch. Um... But the other three abilities are all quite relevant in Commander, um, especially when you get to do two of them. Um, creatures you control get plus one, plus one, gain indestructible and haste in the line of turn. So this can either be... A lot of people are sort of like... like this is a little bit like a very expensive Boros charm in some ways, right? Where you basically are giving... You get to make your... like you, It's it's Wrath Protection if you need it. Um, and often your go-wide decks do want that. But it's also an ability... like It gives you the ability to win with all your creatures by giving them that sort of that Anthem effect. Um which I think is really cool. Um, it's got a Lightning Helix attached to it, which is not bad. I mean, Lightning Helix isn't incredible or anything in Commander, but, you know, there's a lot of X3s and smaller that are very good, right? This kills, you know, a bunch of Mana Dorks, kills little utility creatures like like uh, Metal Worker or like, I don't know, Goblin Engineer, things like that. Just like naming random cards that I've seen in recent games off the top of my head. But bottom line is it'll pick off a bunch of random reasonable creatures. Even there's a lot of Commanders that are very good that die to three damage. So things like Tathiova, for example um and then uh sacred permanent to draw two cards is also like not bad at all right you're essentially like card neutral but again if the permanent was like a like a random token that generated for free that you generated for free off something or a treasure or something like that like then you're just sort of drawing two cards and getting an additional effect out of that and that's all just like very cool to me so i think this card is quite solid not every deck wants it um i'm a little biased because i'm very excited to put this in my kaikar token go wide deck because it sort of like does all the things that that deck wants to do. Um, but generally speaking, I think it's just like generally really cool. Uh, Laurelhold Excavation is a really interesting card. I don't know how good it is, but I like the idea of giving Boros access to abilities like this. Filling your yard, milling yourself has never been in Boros that I know of. Certainly not in Boris and probably not in either of the three other two colors, respectively. Certainly not as an enchantment. So, yeah, like, a lot of interesting things going on here. The actual five mana, like, make a three two ability, pretty irrelevant. Um, pretty irrelevant in Commander, I'm going to guess. But milling yourself for value, I think, can get there. Um, Pete, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna debate you on the milling one card is just not good enough. Uh, it depends on what your, on who your Commander is. Not every Boros deck ever is going to want this, but there are some decks that are going to want this. I don't think it's going to be ubiquitous, but I think I like opening up design space in this way. And even if this is maybe a weaker version of a potential effect like this, I like what this signals for what they're trying to do with the color pair. 
Um, and I like that this card exists because, again, I do think that it can be a role player in certain decks. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. Um, let's see. Uh, moving on, moving on. Magma Opus. It's close, but I don't think it's good enough, even at instant. Eight mana is a lot of mana, even for Commander. And for eight mana, like, I'm expecting to be casting, like, you know, expropriate tier cards especially as a gold card right like mono blue expropriate for nine mana usually gold cards are 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 better for cheaper because they're harder they don't go in as many decks um four damage the body as you choose among any number of targets for eight mana not that exciting getting a random two two or four four is whatever drawing two cards is nice tapping two permanents like not even freezing them just tapping them is like very meh um, like, none of these effects are, they don't scale well to multiplayer. These effects are just too small. Like, obviously the combination of them is really strong, and that's why it costs so much, because you're getting a lot. But none of the effects individually really do that much, and even together you're sort of just, like, doing some stuff. But, like, it's not affecting the board that much. Um, it does have the, uh, the rider of, like, you know, discarded to make a treasure token for two. I think that if it, if this cycled... To make a treasure, if this was discard it, create a treasure, and draw a card, I think this card suddenly becomes extremely playable because then you have the access to the big splashy effect in the late game if you want it without being stuck with a random garbage card in your hand, like on turn two or whatever. But being down a card, like cycling this to make a treasure is is not nothing, but you're still down a card. You discarded a card to make a treasure. And I that, that's just not good. That's not good. Um... So I don't like this card at all, even though it looks very flashy and splashy. I just think that it's no, it doesn't do enough on any of the versions of it to be exciting, sadly. Um, I think Mortality Spear, again, is not exciting, but it's just solid bread and butter removal. Destroy Target non-land permanent for, again, if you're in the deck for it, this will just cost two mana pretty much if you want it to. If you're, if you're in a green-black deck that just literally is incapable of gaining life, then maybe this isn't great. But honestly, for four mana at instant speed, this effect is still really good. So even then, you might still want this over, like, your Putrefy, right? I think this is better at four than Putrefy is at three, personally. Um, and if, again, if you're paying two mana for this, like, then you're just getting, like, I mean, like, you're just getting an Abrupt Decay at that point. Now, again, it's not uncounterable, which Abrupt Decay is, but, like, two mana to destroy target non land permanent instant speed is completely messed up. Like, that's very, very unreasonable. Um, I think that this is, again, going to be basically just staple Golgari removal for till the end of time, probably in most green decks. It's just really, really good. Um, like, very, very strong. Um, let's see. Moving on through a lot of these commons. Uh, Practical Research, I think, is a really cool card. Five mana draw four at instant is pretty good. Um, five mana draw three is typically what you see. Now it does come with the caveat of you do have to discard two of those four if one of them, if you don't discard an instant or sorcery. But I think just like the velocity that this generates, just the amount of raw cards you're actually getting to see is going to create a pretty solid card. Not every deck wants this, but I do think that this card is good and will see play in EDH in some decks. Not all decks, but some. Um, Prismari Command is really close to being edh playable but i don't think that it is two damage to any target is pretty mediocre like the the closest comparison that you can make to this is Colagon's command which and i believe and Colagon's command is also not particularly edh playable or at least again and i'm talking like four player like casual edh cedh this might be efficient enough to actually see play um but in 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 non-cedh which again is largely what i'm talking about here I don't think the effects are are strong enough for what they do. It is a hyper-efficient card. I cannot deny that, right? The ability to destroy an artifact, deal two damage to something. Both of those were on Kolagon's command. Um, you get a Faithless Looting tacked into this, right? The draw two, discard two. Um, target player creates a credit token. This is a fail case. This is like if you literally have nothing better to do. Because like three mana, three mana to Faithless Looting and make a treasure is not a good card. But if it's like... I don't know. I don't really... Like, the treasure mode just feels kind of like a bit of a throwaway mode, honestly. I think something cooler could have been done with that. But this is a this is a cool card, and it's a very flexible card. It's just that all the effects are, again, very small ball, ultimately. Like, I think I would rather just play a Braid than this card. A Braid is deal three damage to any creature. 
Um, so again, this is any target, so that is better, but it's only two damage. But then the short target, like, I don't know. It's flexible, it's interesting. Somebody will probably play it in EDH, maybe multiple somebodies, but I don't think it's very exciting. Um, let's see. Uh, ooh, a bunch of Quadrix cards. Of course, Simic kind of getting the hookup because it always does. It's like pretty hard to design a bad Simic card, honestly, unless you're really trying to. Which there are a couple of in here, but a lot of these are strong. Most of the apprentices, I think, are pretty unplayable um, in Commander, but I think the Quantrix Apprentice is, like, very good. Um, just getting to look at the top three cards of your library anytime you cast an instant sorcery and just pick up a land for free out of them, if there is one there, it's just kind of value. It's not incredible. It's not broken. It's not, like, too good. It's just, it's just good value. Not every deck's going to want it, but I think that there are decks that are definitely pretty happy to just pick up free lands every time they cast their instants and sorceries, and there are Simic decks with lots of instants in it, and that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I think the Apprentice is strong. Uh, Quandrix Command is probably not good enough for Commander play, I think. Um, balancing a creature of Planeswalker is unexciting. Countering target artifact or enchantment spell is good, but I think it's just too niche. I don't think it does enough. Um, and then putting two counters on a creature is whatever. And then shuffling three cards from the graveyard into the library. Like, it's good. Like, you can kind of get somebody, like, with, like, some, like, reanimator stuff. If they're, like, trying to reanimate a card and you shuffle the cards in in response. But then if you're doing that, you're probably not getting to use the counter mode, which I think is the best mode. So then you're probably doing, like, you know, shuffle something in, bounce a creature, which is, like... I know. I don't think I want to spend one of my 99 slots on that, personally. I'm not excited about it, which is a shame because it's cool. But you know what? I think it's actually okay that Quandrix didn't get the best command in this uh, in this cycle for a commander. Um, Quandrix Cultivator is next. Um, we've seen multiple versions of the, this effect before, so it's nothing exciting or groundbreaking. But it is solid. Again, if you want a ramp creature, this is a good ramp creature, right? It's a solid body. And it can find you duels um, and uh, and even triumphs, right? You can fetch, you know, the teamer triumph or what is it? The what is it? Indatha? No, God, I can never. Remember. Ketria triumph. I gotta get you Zagoth or Ketria triumphs. Um, while being within the blue green restriction, of course. Um, if you're playing multiple colors, like five colors, it can get you any of the triumphs, really. Um, I guess not the Marty one. Anywho um bottom line be the yeah like it's solid and the fact that the land does come in untapped uh similar to um wood elves which is which is also relevant right if you need that extra mana for something hold up a counter spell or like you needed two mana and you only had five mana total now you spend four get your extra mana and now you have another thing for two. Oh, chad is informing me that this card says basic never mind you can only get basic lands with this that does make it substantially worse uh because now you're no longer mana fixing uh, because you needed to have at least a blue source and a green source to cast this, which means the only getting another blue source or uh, or green source is not going to fix your mana. Now, maybe you had a triple green or a triple blue spell that you needed help casting. This can do that for you. But that's a lot worse as a basic, to be fair. Um, I like it less. I still think it's okay. Again, you'll know if you want this. Not every deck is going to, but you'll know if you want this, right? Like, it depends. Like, you know, if you want Farhaven Elves and Wood Elves and stuff in your deck, you might want this. Like, Ondu Giant is a card that exists that essentially did the same thing. That one could get any basic, but it came into play tapped. So there's a trade-off there. That's a 2-4. This is a 3-4. This card is okay. I don't think it's going to be great in every deck. But again, if you're playing a deck that wants rampy creatures, this is a decent one. Um, I am sad that it says basic, though uh ooh, quintorius um i've got a friend who's actually uh who's actually built a quintorius deck it looks pretty cool um incidentally this deck is running that enchantment that you were hating on earlier pete um so taste it but again who knows if that card's actually good in the long run but quintorius is a cool little card um a spirit lord again um and then basically just you know rewards you for having cards leave your graveyard for any reason right so this works with escape works with flashback of course, with reanimation, there is a bit of reanimation in white. So, you know, Karmic Guide would count, right? Karmic Guide, reanimate a creature, um, and then get a 3-2 for your troubles. Um, it basically just gives you a bunch of value for doing graveyard-based things. And by value, I mean you just get, like, a decent board presence. Um, it's not broken. It's not super strong or anything, but it's cool. And again, I like that it is encouraging red to explore 
non-combat elements of its color pie, um, exploring the sort of recursion value, like graveyard value stuff that cards like Sun Titan, Savin's Reclamation, and what else sort of have always been hinting at being able to do, but have never been supported like on a larger scale. I think this set is finally embracing that aspect of Boros, and I really, really love that. Like, I think of any of the, the colleges, I think the design of Lorehold is the best for Commander because it is doing is allowing the color the, the, the pair to do things that it hasn't been able to do before, uh, which has always been a big knock against that in general. Um, so yeah, big fan of Quintorius. Um, again, not necessarily on the basis of its own power, but just on the basis of what it means that Boros' design is looking like now, which is cool. Uh... Radiant Scroll Wielder, I think, is definitely a card worth mentioning. Uh, this is another one of the ones we've seen. Uh, we've seen a few of these over the last few years. Instance and sorcery spells you control have lifelink. So basically, this means that all of your burnt, your red deal X damage spells are going to also gain you that much life now, right? Obviously, you know, Blasphemous Act being the sort of poster child, or even, you know, was Star of Extinction being like the big poster child for this, right? Every single thing that gets dealt 20 damage or 13 damage by this will gain you in an instance 30 life or 13 life or 20 life. So you can gain potentially ludicrous amounts of life off of, um, you know, Blasphemous acting a board with this out, um, which is very funny um, and very amusing to me. Um, it also has um, the, uh, I think it's Charmbreaker Devils uh, text. Which is that at the beginning of your upkeep, you exile an instant sorcery card at random from your graveyard, and I may cast it this turn. Um, it's not for free, mind you, so I still have to cast it for the regular price. Um, and it does stay exiled whether or not you cast it after the fact. It doesn't go back to your graveyard or anything, so you can't just like loop the same card every turn over and over if you cast it. Um, but I think it's a reasonably strong card, right? Two different two abilities that are somewhat synergistic, um, and both of them are like kind of cool. Um, so again, there are a lot of decks, you know, uh, you know, Fire Song and Sunspeaker being like, I think probably like the standout one that kind of love effects like this. Um, Savin, I think would probably, this would probably be a decent fit in Savin as well. Other cards as well. But yeah, so I think this card is going to be a, a, a cute little role player in a few different kinds of decks. Ooh, Reconstruct History. I have things to say about this card. I have things to say about this card. Um, I did not realize when I initially read this card that it does not pick creatures up. Or lands. Lands I knew about. That one I kind of knew inherently, but it does not pick creatures up, and that is a big knock. The fact that it does not pick up creatures means that... Oh, man. It can be very good. You can absolutely put this in a deck that is designed around doing this, and it will be strong. But it really bothers me that it's not letting you pick up the most common thing that you will find in a graveyard, right? I don't know. I have mixed feelings about this card. Because again, it's potentially a four mana draw five, which is absurd, obviously. Um, it does exile itself, but like that's fine. Looping reconstructs for in standard might be obnoxious or whatever. Um, it is interesting, and this is a card that lets you get lets you get back both like you know, spells and permanents, which is not a thing that often happens. Often it'll be like, you know, pick up, you know, get up all the permanents or whatever. I actually think I would have preferred this card if instead of instant and sorcery, it was creature and land in addition. And it basically just let you pick up one of each permanent type that exists in the game. Um, I think that that would have been really, really cool. And I think more on flavor for what Boros and Lorehold are about. Um, but it's still good. It's still good. Um, definitely good in a Jeskai deck, right? You're picking up a bunch of different things here. Um, and I do think that that is probably where this card is going to shine is in Jeskai. I may be putting this in my Kaikar deck for similar reasons because I don't run basically any creatures in that deck anyway. Um, I really am sad that it doesn't say land though because like, you know, it'd be really cool if you could pick up like cycling lands and fetch lands and things like that. Maybe that was too good. Sorry, my nose is like super itchy right now. It's very dry. Um, but yeah, so again... Just be careful with this card because it's probably not going to do what you think it's doing um, at first glance. But it is definitely a potential avenue to a lot of value. So, you know, buyer beware, but it's definitely a very cool, unique, and potentially powerful card because of the raw amount of card advantage it's going to generate for you if you can get... I think you really need to be getting at least three of these to want to be playing this. But if you can get three or like four or five, then yeah, you're definitely doing it at that point. Um, you also do want a deck that's doing all of those things, right? Like, not every deck runs Planeswalkers. 
you want to be careful that you're going to be reliably able to do all five in a deck. Even if you're not going to do it the time you cast it, don't put it in a deck where you're missing one of these card types entirely. That's my personal preference. I don't like just playing a card in my deck that's just never going to be able to fully live up to its potential. Um, but again, in, an interesting card. Just definitely a card that's a bit frustrating on a couple of the ways that it's worded. Uh, Return Pascal is like a six mana weird sort of kind of Ewit effect, which is like not great. I don't think anybody should play this. Six mana for a 4-2 flyer that gets you a spirit and instant or sorcery card back. Probably not going to be where you want to be at. It's probably not it. But maybe there's a very dedicated spirit tribal deck that just really wants this card. Who knows? Uh, Rip Apart is a tragedy. I think it's a really cool card. I think that it's really interesting that it's so flexible. I think there are two things that are hurting this card. And I think that is, A, obviously the fact that it's a sorcery. Being a sorcery just really, really hurts this. Again, I just can't help but come back to a braid, giving you the choice of choose one, deal three damage to a creature, or destroy target artifact. So, like, yes, you're basically getting a Planeswalker and an enchantment as a bonus for swapping white in for a colorless and sorcery in for instant. But I don't think that's good enough to justify its inclusion most of the time. A dedicated Boros deck might want this but even then i just think that there are better ways to be more flexible with your removal than this i think that the other way this card could have been better and more appealing is if it was choose one or both you keep it at sorcery speed fair enough but you let me do one of each of these things right so i get to deal three damage to a creature and also blow up an enchantment then i think this card also becomes super playable i think it becomes super interesting at that point i don't think i like it in its current form. I think one of those two things needed to change. Either it needed to be an, an instant with the same wording, or it needed to be a sorcery with choose one or both. I don't like it, given that it has neither of those personally. But I also think that it is a fine card. Um, I just think you could probably do better. Uh, Rutha is really interesting. Um, a neat commander, for sure. Um, I haven't even started thinking about the various dumb things you could probably do with this. Um, but again, this is sort of like adding, uh, like this is sort of just like a twin cast as you, in your command zone, right? You basically cast her and then maybe on the same turn, maybe on the next turn, same turn is very expensive because it's a five minute twin cast, but you're basically just like a, like a one turn delayed twin cast in your command zone where basically on your next turn, you can cast a really cool spell and then you get to pay two and copy that spell. And then you're not just wasting the twin cast. Like if the twin cast is in your yard, you get to recast the Rutha at some point and then do it again. So like it's a, it's gonna be fun. I don't know how powerful it is overall, but the ability to twin cast a spell every few turns is is reasonable. Um, so I'm sure this will see some play somewhere. Uh, let's see what else we have. Um, Rushed Rebirth is a really weird card and a really interesting card. I am very curious to see how this will play out in practice. So this says it's a it's black and a green for an instant. Choose target creature when that creature dies this turn. Search your library. For a creature card with lesser mana value, put it on the battlefield, tap, and then shuffle. So, notably, this doesn't have to be one of your own creatures. So, basically, anytime any creature of your choice dies, you get to just go find another creature that was a bit that that's a bit smaller than that one, and then just get it for free, and it goes, comes into play directly. So, it's like a sort of like weird birthing pot effect but again you don't need to sack your own thing so if like if somebody's casting a wrath of god effect you can like target the biggest creature on the board with this and then go get a largest creature out of your own deck that'll be there after the wrath resolves so like there are a lot of gonna be like there's gonna be a lot of like really cool use case scenarios for this card but it's really difficult to like build around it I think it's going to be really cool, though. I'm, like, looking forward to seeing all the really, like, cool, flashy plays that people do with this card. I think this is a really interesting card and a really uh, neat effect to have uh, in the format. Um, definitely something to look out for if you're holding Wrath playing against the Black-Green player. This is a thing that could happen, and they could just end up with, like, a big dummy after you've used your Wrath. Um, and maybe it even has a cool, like, effect. Like, can you imagine, like, somebody just, like... I'm just, I'm just trying to think, you know, like, somebody Wrath the board, you do this... And you wind up like pulling like an agent of treachery out of your like you're playing sim uh, salt or whatever you pull out like agent of treachery out after the fact get a card from like it's a lot of cool things can be done with this um let's see uh okay shadrick silverquill our next elder dragon um 
I don't think I like this one. I think that the modes are just like a little bit unexciting, if we're being honest. So it's a five mana two five flying double strike. So this essentially hits for four. Um, and then it has a, at the beginning of each combat trigger, um, for one of three, uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for some number of three possible abilities. Interestingly, you have to choose two of them, but they both modes have to target a different player. So like, this is a bit of a playing politics thing where you're going to get one of the modes, presumably, but you have to let an opponent get one of the other modes. So the modes are, somebody gets a two, one white, black, uh, flying white, black, uh, inkling creature. Uh, somebody loses a uh, life and draws a card, and then somebody puts a counter on each creature they control. Uh, a 1-1 one -one counter specifically. Plus one, plus one. Um, again, I just really dislike group hug cards. I don't like getting my opponent free things, even if they're marginal effects the way that some of these are. It's just... I don't know. I, I, I'm, a, I'm generally very averse to it. I'm not a big fan of this card. But again, if you like playing politics and you like doing this kind of negotiating stuff... This could be the card for you. And the or the, the Silver Quill legendaries from this set, both in the pre-con and the um in the pre-con and the the the, the base uh set do do a lot of that. So if that's your thing, this is your this is your guild or your school, college. College? College. Um ooh, Silver Quill Command is our next command. Uh Trigger Creature has plus three plus three gains flying on turn, boring. Return target creature card with converted main cost two or less from your graveyard of the battlefield. That's kind of interesting. That's you know that's a, a one shot Luris effect. Uh, target player draws a card, and loses life. Fine. Uh, target opponent sacks a creature. Eh. Um. Again, not really a fan of this one. The effects are just very, very, very marginal. The best one is the recursion one for sure. Like most of the time, this is going to be recur a two drop, draw a card, lose life. That's what's going to happen for four mana. At sorcery speed. Sorry, I also forgot to mention, this one is a bloody sorcery. Which, why? This didn't need to be a sorcery. This effect is, these effects are not powerful enough to be sorcery. Maybe, maybe it's balancing for other formats, to be fair. I could be, I could be missing some stuff for Constructed. But for Commander, th this ain't it. This ain't it. Um, let's see. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Anything else interesting in here? Uh, ooh, Tanazir Quandrix. Okay, our, our next Elder Dragon. Possibly our last one? I forget if there's another one. Either way, this is the Quandrix one. Uh, so five mana, four, four flying trample. Like already just very reasonable stats. Uh, it's not too expensive and it's a good sized body. When it enters the battlefield, double the number of plus one, plus one counters on target creature control. So not everything, but still one thing gets twice as big when it enters. Um, not terrible, but you do need to have counters on something already, right? This doesn't place counters. It's not like put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature, then double the number of 1-1 one, one counters, something like that. So this won't do anything if you don't already have a creature with counters on it. But if you do, it'll get pretty thick. Um, when it attacks, you may have the base power and toughness of other creatures you control become equal to Tanazir Quandrix's power and toughness at the end of turn. So basically, all of your creatures... Um, all of your counters are... Or all of your creatures become base 4-4s four or larger if Quandrix is larger, right? So if you put two counters on Quandrix, then they all become base 6-6s six when they attack. So this obviously incentivizes you to attack with creatures that have counters on them because the counters will be additive to the base power toughness that they have, um, which is kind of cool. Obviously, this works really nicely with, like, Fractals, but I don't know how good Fractals actually are in practice in Commander. But, right, your Fractals are 0-0, zero, zero, so they're actually going to become base 4-4s four with whatever counters they already have on them. So they're going to become, like... Essentially, all your creatures get plus four, plus four. Or all your fractals get plus four, plus four. Um, I don't know exactly how good this card is. I'm also pretty okay with the Simic Commander not being broken for once, if we're being honest. Um, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Um, not not super excited about it, but not unreasonable. Uh, ooh, Tend the Pest. This is a very cool card. Very, 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 very cool card. So again, this is a niche card. Not every... Even Golgari deck is going to want this, but the Golgari decks that want this are going to be very hype about it. So basically, you sack one ideally largest creature and get a whole buttload of tiny pests. So that becomes really nice with things like um, sack outlets. Becomes really nice with things like you know if you've got an Ashnod's altar or a uh, or a Phyrexian altar that can generate a ton of mana for you, somewhat out of nowhere. 
Um, it's obviously absurd with, uh, you know, Gaia's Cradle and things like uh, Cryptolith Rites and things like that. You can get, like, you can make a lot of mana for yourself that way. Um, if you've got other effects that want you to sack creatures, right, you, like, sack one creature to make a bunch of creatures. And then you, like, start sacking each individual creature to, like, gain a life and draw a card. Things like that, right? Village Rites type effects. It's a really, really interesting card. It's a very um engine card right you're not just doing this for no reason but but it's gonna be really cool when you do it um yeah i'll be curious to see what people end up doing with this the art is also very creepy um thrilling discovery is a pretty cool card for uh for boros to have the obvious uh comparison to this is cathartic reunion uh which is one in red for a very similar effect the difference is that for one and a red, um, so this one is you gain two life, then you may discard two cards, and if you do, draw three cards. So you don't draw the three unless you discard the two. So I could hypoth hypothetically just cast this for two mana, gain two life. Don't do this. This is terrible. Um, this basically is better against counter magic because you're not uh, getting... Well, not, for, com for comparison, by the way, Cathartic Reunion requires you to discard the two cards as an additional cost. So you're doing that no matter what. So basically what winds up happening is this is better against counter magic because if they just counter the spell, you didn't have to discard two additional cards. Um, what it's worse though is with copy effects because every time you copy this, you're required to still to discard two cards again in order to discard draw the three cards. Whereas if you copy Cathartic Reunion, you've already paid the cost to discard two cards. So now any copies are just straight up just draw three extra cards. So like it depends on what you're doing with the cards and what your intended uh, use uh, usage is, but, but generally kind of cool. Generally kind of cool. Um, all right, then we have Vanishing Verse. Um, one in the black for an instant exile target monocolored permanent. So, of course, the closest comparison to this one is... Oh, I'm forgetting. Uh, Ultimate Price? Ultimate Price, which is a one in the black instant destroyer target monocolored creature. So this obviously hits as permanent. Um, now, notably, this does not hit lands, even though it, does say, it doesn't say non-land permanent, because lands are not colored. I mean, you can give them a color, probably, through weird means. But, but generally speaking, lands are colorless and therefore not monocolored. Um, this requires them to be one of the actual five colors, of which colorless is not. Um, it also doesn't kill gold cards, uh, which is relevant in a lot of EDH decks. Uh, so again, this is going to be meta-dependent for your inclusion, I assume. Notably, this is another Sunforger card, um, if you want it to be. This can be part of a Mardu Sunforger package. Um, but again, you'll know if your meta has a lot of gold cards in it or not. Um, if it's good, it's good. And if it's not, it's probably not. Um, like notably, this is not going to kill most people's commanders. Cause like, obviously there are a lot of monocolor commanders and people do play them, but there are a lot more gold commanders. So, and that can't, this can't kill commanders. So yeah, your mileage may vary and you'll probably know better than I will if it's right for your play group. Uh, but, but definitely keep an eye out on this card. Like it, it is, it is a solid card. It's just not always going to be a good card for your meta. Um, okay, and here is our actual last dragon. I knew I was missing one. Uh, so Vilomachus Lorehold um, is a 7-mana 5-5 five five, uh, with Flying, Vigilance, and Haste. So reasonably statted body. I mentioned early on, because this is, what I think, one of the first dragons that got spoiled. Um, I mentioned this either on stream or in Discord somewhere. I don't remember who I've told. I've soapboxed about this one. But I do wish the body was a little bigger on the front side. Like, not even more toughness, but I do kind of wish this had the 7... I wish this had 7 power, quite honestly. Um... And I'll tell you, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, when it attacks, look at the top seven cards of your library. You may cast an instant or sorcery uh, spell with mana value less than or equal to Velomachus's power from among them without paying its mana cost. So a couple of things here and then put the rest in the bottom in a random order. So thing to remember here is you look at the top seven cards, but the ones you get to cast are tied to how large the dragon is. Now I'm guessing this is exactly why they kept it at five power and not seven or whatever, because there's probably a lot more dumb things you could do even within Boros for the seven that are not an option now that it's only five or less. Obviously, you can also grow this if you put a sort of X and Y on this. Now you do get to look at seven drops, but then you have to add extra things. Um, but one of the biggest things that came out... Yeah, I mean, approach is actually valid, uh, a valid point and perhaps a reason not to do this. Um... But uh, one of the first things that people started theory crafting was like there are a ton of spells that say um, untap all creatures, take an extra combat step after this one. Um, world uh, was it like World at War, um, Aggravate.
And that's pretty cool, because like, you can take a lot of combats in a row without spending extra mana with this card. Because it has haste, you can actually do that on the very same turn if you chain enough of them together. Um, and that could just result in a win right away. Um, the only thing is, you need five of them to win with this card, whereas if it had more power, you would only need as little as um, as three if it was a seven if it was a seven x right because you go three or you go seven fourteen twenty one dead um i'm assuming that there was some power cap stuff they didn't want this to just kill people out of nowhere i think a lot of people are just probably correctly looking at this as narset light um that being the the six mana narset um that people frequently just like casting infinite expropriates and time warps off of and is a miserable deck this is basically like a fairer version of that um on multiple axes it's killable it's more expensive you don't get blue so you don't get actual time locks Etc. Etc. I think it's a cool card. I think it's probably a relatively powerful card, but it is also very slow um, in a color combination that's not terribly good at ramping. So your mileage may vary, but you can definitely probably do some pretty splashy things with this, um, all things considered. Um, all right, Venerable War Singer is the next one. I think this word is worth a mention, although it's going to be a little bit difficult to make it happen since it is a combat damage and not even an on attacks trigger, but it's actually on an, on combat damage trigger. It does have tremble, so like it's not that hard to make the steel combat damage, but as a 3-3, three, three, I feel like you probably need to juice this a little bit in order to make it get through, like for sure. Especially because anything that has an on-combat trigger is gonna make people not want to let it connect if they can avoid it. Um so what does this do on combat? It says you may return target creature with mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, which is very strong, where X is the amount of damage Venerable War Singer dealt to that player. So yeah, you basically want to be suiting this uh this creature up, hitting with as much damage as possible because every point of trample that gets through on this creature will get you back a larger permanent. Um, it's a bit conditional. Like, it's a lot of hoops to jump through. Like, again, Savin's Reclamation, Sun Titan, these are all cards that sort of just do very similar things for a lot less effort. So, again, not really sure if this will actually wind up panning out, but it is a good effect, even if it is requiring you to jump through a reasonably large number of hoops to get the effect um okay our next card we need to talk about uh because this is you know oops accidental combo card um so wither bloom apprentice is a uh four mana or two mana two two um it is our last apprentice from the wither bloom faction um it has magecraft whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell each opponent loses one life and you gain one life so um from a set from many many years ago called onslaught there was a cycle of uh chains uh, the main one people usually think about is Chain of Vapor, which is basically allows you to bounce a, car, uh, a permanent of your opponents for one mana. Um, but then they can choose to copy that and then bounce your own thing. But then if you, they copy it, you get to do it. So you kind of just like, as long as people agree to keep copying it, you can keep bouncing things left, right, and center. Um, which is why it doesn't see a ton of play because it can backfire any pretty badly. There's a black version that no one's ever played before because of how horrible it looked on at face value, which says, um, I believe the black one is Chain of Smog and it costs two mana. And it says target player discards two cards for two mana. But then that person then gets to recast a copy of that spell and send it back at you. And then you get to, but then if they do that, you get to do that. So the idea is like, you know, you can all just kind of like just demolish your hands to the Stone Age if you feel like it. Now, what this does, though, is that the target player does not have to be an opponent. And so if you have a Witherbloom Apprentice out and you target yourself with Chain of Vapor, um, or Chain of Smog, rather, uh, you can essentially just infinitely copy it and retarget yourself. You will obviously just eradicate your entire hand, but you do get to just literally put infinite copies of this on the stack for as long as you want. And every time you do that, because this very specifically says cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, you essentially just get to um, Tendrils of Agony people right out of the game um, by just having this and then targeting yourself with Chain of Smog. Notably, and I did forget to mention this earlier in the set review, the Liliana also does this. The Liliana is literally just a big version of this where it's actually just Tendrils, like the two and two as opposed to the one and one. So both this and that card literally just go infinite with Chain of Smog by itself and kills the entire table um so that's pretty strong um i am curious people have speculated as to whether or not the um the card chain of smog might get banned in edh i personally think that they should um i don't think that that is a particularly fun or interesting combo to have people have access to 
I think that it's fine to print cards that accidentally break old cards sometimes, especially because it's a random terrible card that was good in exactly zero decks ever. I think it's fine to just ban a random nonsense card to prevent unfun interactions with cooler, more broadly applicable cards like this. Because this could be cool if you're doing it, you know, in measured amounts, right? You know, you just get value from casting your spells. But just going infinite yourself with yourself in a way that was not intended to be the design for it just feels like, I don't know, it just doesn't need to be a thing. They probably won't because the rules committee is notoriously gun shy about banning things, which is probably for the best in a in a in a in a broader context. But I'm not looking forward to having somebody just like kind of just play goldfish and just cast with a bloom and chain of smog and just win out of nowhere. It's uninteractive. It's boring. It's kind of whatever. Again, personal philosophy. If that's your cup of tea, then so be it. But I will kindly request that you not do so if you sit down at the commander table with me anyway. Um. But yeah, so worth noting that this is part of an accidental two-card uh, win-the-game combo. Um, can't overlook that, since it is legal in the format as of the time of this recording. Um, with a Bloom Command, uh, target player mills three cards. Uh, so this one's also a sorcery, but it only costs two. Target player mills three cards, then you return a land card from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, destroy target non-creature, non-land permanent with mana value two or less. Target creature gets minus three, minus one until end of turn, and target opponent loses two life, and you gain two life. This is probably one of the better ones, but it's still pretty marginal. So there are probably some decks out there that want this. Some of these effects are reasonable. Milling three cards and getting a land back is not a bad effect. Uh, destroying a small permanent, not a bad effect. The minus three minus one is like a little bit redundant with these, but you can also potentially pick off two separate permanents with this, right? They kind of target the same general size of creature, generally, like that being said. So I don't know how much I love that overall. Like... They basically, like, it could be just... But it could just be kill two small creatures for two mana. And that's totally fine, I think. Especially early enough in the game where that matters, right? You can pick off a couple of mana dorks, right? You're playing, you know, somebody had a land of elves and somebody else played a bird of paradise, right? So you kill their bird of paradise and then minus three, minus one, the land of elves. And, like, that's not bad, right? You got rid of their rampy things. Um, so, again, there's, there's, there's use cases for this, but it's not super exciting to me. Um, but it is probably one of the more EDH applicables of the, uh, of the cycle. Um, and then, finally, our last gold card is Zimone Quadric, Quandrix Prodigy, um, which is essentially just, the way I see it, is basically just Fair Thrasios, um, which means that it probably won't see play if people are playing Strictly Optimized. Um, I think that Zimone is quite good, um, but she uh, they're all tap abilities, which means you can't just dump an infin infinite mana and draw your whole deck or anything. Um, but the ability to just put a land into play early on, right? You're drawing cards in your Simic deck, you're putting extra lands in, so it does ramp you, assuming you have the land drops to make. Um, and then in the late game, it will at least draw you a card and probably draw you two cards every turn cycle, which is not bad. And is and this does function really nicely with cards like um, Seaborn Muse. Um, I guess Seaborn Muse really right now is the only card like Seaborn Muse. To be fair, um, but still, this is really great with Seaborn Muse. Not that not that it takes a lot to make Seaborn Muse a good card, um, because you'll get to untap your lands and Zamone every turn, uh, which means you'll get to draw two cards every turn cycle, which is really good. Um, so again, if you're building strictly for power, then Thrasios is probably just better, um, as I've said, but Zone is still a really cool little card. Um, but yeah, that takes us to the end of the gold card.